Cynthia Cruz is a writer and multidisciplinary artist. She is the author of six collections of poems, the latest being Guidebooks for the Dead, out from Four Way Books in 2020. She is also the editor of Other Musics, an anthology of contemporary Latina poetry, University of Oklahoma Press, 2019. Disquieting, essays on silence, a collection of critical essays exploring the concept of silence as a form of resistance was published by Book Hug in the spring of 2019. The Melancholia of Class, her second collection of critical essays, an exploration of melancholia and the working class is forthcoming from Repeater Books in 2021. There is another world, Paul Eluard famously wrote, but it's inside this one. When encountering a Cynthia Cruz poem, I'm reminded of other worlds, dimensions, not only that they exist, but that they offer alternative values, visions, and possibilities for the one we currently inhabit. This, then, is a poetics built on forging the no, the refusal, as a means of amplifying a woman's personhood within a culture so often bent on nulling her will to think and dream of paths seldom or, at times, never before taken. This embodied intelligence is exactly where Cruz's poems thrive, a thinking mapped across the lyric where inquiry becomes the foundation for discovery and imaginative amplitude. Hers is a poetics that refigures the dominant culture's fetishization of certainty as power and conclusion as progress. Cruz holds the liminal spaces of race, class, and elliptical aesthetics, not as a trap to be worked out of, but perhaps as the only place worth creating from. One where no path is foreclosed and all futures, however fraught, remain capacious. Drawing from a literary tradition that, at least to this reader, harnesses works as vast as that of Jean Valentine, Wong Mei, Hannah Arendt, Norma Elia Gantu, Gwendolyn Brooks, Lorene Niedeker, and Mark Fisher, Cruz's work, even in these newer essays, refuse cohesion in favor of complication via rigorous quests for alterity. The result of which is a perennially inspiring body of text that spans nearly two decades, only to increase in raising its own urgency and power. It is with great pleasure then that I welcome my good friend and truly idiosyncratic thinker to UMass Amherst, Cynthia Cruz. Thank you, Ashton. That was so beautiful and generous. So I am going to, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read poems from my first book, Ruin, from uh, 2006. I'm going to go through, like running a marathon, I'm going to begin in Ruin, and I'm going to go to Guidebooks for the Dead, which is the book that just came out in March. And then I'm also going to be reading um, Sorry. I'm also going to be reading from uh, from some unpublished, some books that are um, that are soon to be published. They're forthcoming, but they're not published yet. So you'll see the um, hopefully you'll see the movement. Um, and I'm just going to read them. I probably won't say anything um, between them. I'll just start and read. <clears throat> so these I'm reading three poems from Ruin, the first collection. Microscopic Winter 2. You say there are no words in the English language for the dark flocking of your sadness. And spent 11 months at sea recording what you were certain was the light at the end of the world. After the winter of milk baths, rooms of shortwave radios, and your lifelong study of the saints, you wrote me of the accident in father's bathroom, the perfect slant of the blade and how fast it all happened. You said you could feel the opening of your mind like a kingdom of light, then a dark bead coming at you like a black sun. The next morning I went up to the roof, climbed in the wire coop and set your boyhood falcon free. 
Toby to spray paint, wheat paste, homemade skateboard. California suburbs are the slums of the future. What isn't taken by the cops is co-opted for endless banks of black television sets. And the LA sun is junk white. Vegas hot, it burns the cinder block of the strip mall parking lot. Someone's mother's pickups parked with a glue sniffing family of kids inside and everyone is dead in my America. Sparks, Nevada. In the middle of the night, father brought me a falcon. By morning, it ripped the wire and flew the hill into the highway. When they found me in that car, my sleeve stemmed in blood. I didn't know what it was I was trying to kill. I saw a craft of orphans streaming down the river. They were dressed in white and silent as a seance. It was then I spoke to the bird. Already God is shaking his black seed back into me. So that's the first one. Um, and I'm going to read two poems from the second collection, The Glimmering Room. Kingdom of Dirt. Soon the ambassadors from the nether world will begin their jet-like descent. Death disguised inside me already. As sleeves, grime and her magnificent Bible hallucinating helicopters. Brother Reiner childlike and wrecked. Infamy and the cosmology of chronic raveling and unraveling, or displaced insanity. Dirty Cindy little glitter of her father's spit, invisible androgynous, a fragment of his, found at the bottom of his dream chest. Draped in my black cape of smut, blue, and subterranean, they mistake me for a man in drag in my nasty boot. Why just look, a manifestation of stars. Or appoint me hustler, a brutal Reiner in his kinky noir scheme. Me at 13 on the beach in a candy striped bikini. In time or out of time, glamorine. Room of the underworld, please come with me to the discotheque at the end of the world. Kiss elegant at the halfway house for the trashed and gone galore. Meet me in the love burned orchard where the beautiful doomed meet at last. And this is called Molotov. I got my dream pills. They're wrapped in tin foil and it's going to be all right. I got sweet Billy with me and he is still breathing and it's beautiful what they're telling us. I've got my enzymes, a nickel bag of electrolytes. My entire life, I have been waiting for this. I've got my radio on. I've got it hooked into a chip and lodged inside a suburb of thought in my brain somehow. And it's weird how it's wired. I can hear the fires. I can hear the daisies as they fell the desert, pretty machete-like paper mache confetti of drop cluster bombs, and now I can hear the black hawks wild in their swarm. And I've got my horses and I'm holding beautiful Billy in my arms. It's like a song. And one poem from Wunderkammer, it's called Naven Belt. Naven Belt. Subverted my psychosis to watery ornament was found drowned in a cream velvet mini gown, mind blown out like a city with no electricity, all lines cut. The brain a kaleidoscopic disco, but nothing another viewing of mother courage couldn't fix. And a trunk labeled trauma packed with piles of miniature stife. I was dreaming evacuation, watching at the locked glass window I can see 
the satanic mills of industry and a small white horse dragging the carriage of lost memory. Rapturous in accordion plays, God save the queen and Paris is burning. After I licked clean the saucers of schlag and ceiling high cream cakes, I ran 12 miles in my ballet leotard through the German forest of snow. How do I feel about my botched suicide now? Lacing up my skating boots, I vanish, silvery paste of vapor on the ice. A row of pretty blonde dummies in the Dutch Death Museum, death dressed in Chanel and Maharaja paste jewels, a vibrant green bacteria of sea and decay. Okay, here we go. Um, these are from How the End Begins. The flooding subject. All night the foxes creep out from the river, their mouths bearded in silver streams of wonder. Silent children, secret carriers of the invisible kingdom. They are not my sisters. They share the same soul, but it is not mine. I follow their breath into the wooded thicket. Their awful bodies are stained in blood. I hear music. It is everywhere and I cannot stop it. Soon my brother walks out from the black, an angel from the lake or a forgotten saint, his face stained in sorrow. From the willow near the water where all the doves are perched, I can see the soft hillside of our childhood. Now the foxes are nothing just a faint glimmer in the distance. My brother stands before me, reading the Gospel of Mark from inside the palm of his hand. And this is called Midnight Office. The child is not dead, she is sleeping. Gone from this world, which is broken. The angel of Michael outside the garden, his circle of fire maddening around the tree. He put the word back into her, a heavy kind of music. Then she was free as we all are. All night I stood in the icy wind, praying for the storm to destroy me. But the wind blew through me like I was a hologram. If you say I am a mystic, then fine, I'm a mystic. The trees are not trees anyway. Okay. So, and these are uh, from Dregs. Just two, the last two poems actually from the collection. Silencer. Sorrow in the black strip of film. Sorrow in the black strip of film, the static of the television set. Delicate glass vase filled with flowers. Telepathy phenomena. I wanted to make a star-like cluster of sticky jewels inside a veil of indescribable music. I wanted the work to die inside me like a Tarkovsky or a Bellatar movie. Delicate paper cutouts made as children, or masks made with paper plates and white string to hide the face behind. All great works, they say, have death inside their making. The last film in the world. The black panorama of poverty. It's warm lies and death. It's liquor stores and detritus. The fevering ghost of compulsion Whiskey, death, or the book. I cannot stop. The music is a feral silver milk. It is my filthy home. I walk to the broken gates and I enter. And so these are from uh, the current book, Guidebooks for the Dead. I'm going to read three poems from here. Guidebooks for the Dead. Guidebooks for the Dead or the beginnings of deadly illness. I exist only inside its murky frame, dirt and dregs, filth and silt. 
mother's red and silver suitcase filled with old lottery tickets and photographs. Everything behind us is before us, stretch out in endless gray horizon. What we don't remember lives in us forever. Guidebooks for the dead. Mother's crimson leather bags crammed with saint cards and tiny glass bottles. The bright stitch of God's final coming. Dirt and dregs, silt and stars. The sweet song of poverty, rinsing through like the memory of a dream. And this is called the Siberian Wolf and Horse. Poverty and sorrow change the face. Everything I own, I sold. Silver liner along the eyes and cobalt cream eyeshadow. Living inside the desert missile range. White ash chalk, small lace dust of what is left. So that's the newest book. And then um, let me just take a look. So I, um, so there's three collections that I uh, haven't published yet that are uh, forthcoming. So I'm reading you some from those. So this is from a collection called Hotel Belgrade. It was a kind of archival project where I tried to incorporate uh, what was happening in my life and in my mind and my studies into the work. So they're a little different. This is called Fragment Pollen. Relentless, the song that keeps me up every night now for weeks. The color of crimson, its feel is rich on the skin of food-like substance, but more precise and hopeful. Secret, it sounds like a murmur, unrecognizable, just like this. I bought myself a cream-colored blouse, French with tiny shell buttons and a narrow black ribbon like tie for survival, a book of Unica Zorn's last letters, sketches, ephemera, and a pair of white stockings in dot like pattern like snow in summer in Grunwald or near my neighborhood, the forest at the precipice near the water at daybreak. The days here are not like days at all but instead like a film, the top layer of dream. The city I am in is completely different from Brooklyn. And also it is exactly the same. I'm reading Zern's final letters to her sister after she followed Belmar to Paris. Her tiny drawings are exquisite and an intricate like the broken traces of memory that occur upon waking. Everything I eat here tastes the same, like cream filled pastries or warm milk served in a porcelain cup to a child unable to sleep in the middle of the night. You confuse yourself, she said, so you can tell yourself you don't know, but you do, she said, you do. And this is from the same collection that's called Hotel Letters. Chanel creams and training plans for marathons, Laura Dix and magnesium, piles of glass bottles of nail polish and a silver cosmetic case of unused Tom Ford makeup. When I woke this morning, I could sense the beginning of the end. Three months in the black flame of the desert and still they could not cure my father. You learn to live with it, I wrote once in a letter black and white photographs of Mexicans in the locked archive of the Ethnological Museum in Berlin. And still they cannot stop asking me where this mysterious illness derives from. It finally hit me and now I've taken to smoking cigarettes and riding the U-Bahn to its end. Michelle in Almaty and her letters like snapshots like Adamite Polaroids in which he documents everything he owns and their gaseous auras. Sabina says, honesty is the only antidote for shame. She is trying to save me, but I am tired. And besides, I'm telling you everything. 
Okay, so this poem is from a collection called Back to the Woods. Um, it's called Like We Were Never Born. I met my mother when I was seven in a river. She was beautiful, her long black hair smelling of mountain. Wurlitzer and the broken glass of black ice. The shade of brush. I was living among the hounds and the horses. At night, I was listening to intricate and more sinister decibels. The music of radio frequency, the delicate scratch and crackle that occurs between distant cities, black sediment and ash, songs not my own, old field recordings begin their haunting. One morning, my body naked and flat on the back along the silver church pew. There was no sky and my hands, they are not mine. Touching water, I wake walking through a field of voices in a stranger's suit, deep in the warm dream of another man's disappearance. And these are the last two I'll read, and these are from uh, another collection called Terror Lullabies. This is called Drive. I lost track, and now I am lying again on my back upon the soft black leather inside a white noise of silence. Escape, but to what? The body isn't really a form of transport, is it? The body is just another means of holding me back. And this is called Hotel Belgrade, residue, cellophane, liquid amber, pearl resin on cardboard. That's the title. <laughs> Platinum blonde with white boxes of Russian chocolates. Silver liquid glitter, lemon candle, crimson leather, 1970 Mercedes sedan interior. Gumdrops, fox fur, cream blouse with gold speck and tiny orange embroidered flourishes. Royal blue child size suitcase crammed with books on the death drive and Hegel's dialectics. Thick white face paint. Liquid amber, pale pink powder, cream ballet, leotard, root beer, blood stain, deathscape, an index of nothing and never, what the mind cannot handle, the body must contain, broken shards of memory, a glass vial of mercury, drop down to the concrete ground. Thank you so much for listening. Wow, thank you, Cynthia. That was so beautiful and incredible. And I'm sure if the audio was on for everyone, it'd be full of applause. So thank <laughs> thank you. Um, we're just going to take a quick five minute break before Ocean's discussion with Cynthia. So grab a snack, grab a beverage of your choice, and we'll see you in five.
Hello. Hi. Hi, Cynthia. Hi. Hi, everyone. Oh, thank you so much for waiting and being here and coming back. Uh, what a fantastic reading. Um, I'm just going to uh, dive right into the discussion. There's so much to talk about. Um, I know uh, it's, I just want to say it's a deep pleasure to, to know you through these years, Cindy, as a, as a friend, a colleague, a fellow writer um, coming out of parents of working class um, immigrant parents, um, you know, negotiating, uh, both of us negotiating our first um, lives as uh, folks in higher education, as folks in um, writing. So I, I think I just want to dive right into, you know, you said um, in your essay here that your book Ruin, which is something that is supposed to be the relic of uh, an empire or the relic of the past. You said that for you, ruin is actually akin to origin. And I want to just read a little bit here uh, from what you've written uh, in the essay. You, says, you say, when I began my education as a part-time community college student in my 20s, my goal was to speak on behalf of the silenced. In my mind, the silenced at that time were those in my closest proximity my own family. And later you say, being seen is not enough. If my father, a Mexican American with no formal training and no schooling beyond grade school due to his family's poverty had been given the same opportunities as his colleagues while in the Air Force, he would have able, been able to use those 20 years of experience to find a decent long-term job providing him and our family insurance, retirement, and security. Instead, though he was teaching his white colleagues what he knew, he was never promoted. Instead, he watched as those white colleagues moved past him up the ladder. My father was not not seen. He was seen, and he was exploited. And I think the, 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 the perennial charge in your poems is this desire to be seen but seen on one's own terms, which is why I, I, I read this, the elliptical lyric, the fragmentation in your work as this sort of negotiation with what can be seen when the writer is now within her agency through the page to curate how she could be seen because so much of her lineage, including herself and her family has been misseen. Um, so how, what, how have you, grown or moved and negotiated your poems in the way you look at what is visible and what is not visible from origin since now uh, that we've had over six books since then? It's a great question. It's a, it's a, it's a big question, I think. Um, the, and there's so, I mean, there's so much I could say, but the thing, I think this is in the book, I forgot, um, but I, I think that so part of what I was thinking about was um, in an interview somewhere somebody asked me about my books and what I thought of them and I think at the time and this is what struck me was at the time I thought that ruin was um, very sort of elementary right rudimentary I think that's what I thought and that I had um, that since then I had come so far and my writing was you know more whatever it was but when I said that to the person it occurred to me immediately that actually that that was the problem, right? That the further away I got, I thought I was becoming this other thing. And that other thing was not who I really was, but it wasn't, it was this nothing, which is where this book that I'm working on that I'm finishing right now comes from, which is, um, you know, I thought if I got away from who I was, then I would have different possibilities. And what I found out was that wasn't true. Yes, and that actually um, who I am is what formed me. I don't know if this is answering your question, but um, that's part of it. But then the other thing, right, is about being seen, but being seen on my own terms and the curating is, is right. And I think um, I was, you know, after I just did this reading right now, I was thinking about the, the work that comes after Dregs and Guidebooks for the Dead. And those books were really important because those were books where I was trying to write about um, 
marginalization and poverty and, and all of these experiences, but, but trying to um, avoid stereotype, mm -hmm. right, or tropes or any of this stuff. So how do you write about that stuff? So it's all about the form, form and language taking the place of it. Um, and I think that was really important for me to start, like you said, negotiating, trying to figure out another language for writing about these things and also refusing and resisting to use any of these, um, these, these ideas that are shared in the culture, these stereotypes, right? That I'm not ever going to be using that stuff. And I know that that would, um, I mean, that has to do with capitalism, neoliberalism too, but I just won't do it. And often I'll think like, what would my father think if I did that, right? And, and of course he wouldn't be down with it. I don't know. I don't know if that answers. Was no. it a question? <laughs> was it a question? I feel like it was more, it was like this thing, but complexity is really important because my own background, my father's background is very complex, my mother, right? And so to reduce, I think is a kind of violence. Right, and I refuse to do it, but that makes it harder for something to be sold. I guess is what I'm saying, right? Yes. Oh, I'm so glad you're you're going deep right away. I'm so happy. <laughs> I always do. <laughs> That's all of mine. Drink that big cup of tea. Um, <laughs> I mean, you're especially as teachers in MFA programs. You know, we're we're talking often to younger writers starting to make their stake, particularly a lot of writers of color and. The, the concern that I myself see and a lot of my students of color see is, you know, how do I speak on my own terms without turning the things that are important to me into exotifications? Mm -hmm. And often we have no control over that, right? I think when I started writing, when I got to New York, the big conversation was among Asian American writers was, do we put in the mango or take it out? Right. I mean, it was more complicated than that, but essentially that was the conversation. It was around the mango. And it was, if we put it in, all of a sudden it's a motif that could be sold and recognizable to a white literary establishment. If we take it out and then we actually we start, you know, the, the counter argument was that maybe we're losing something central to us. Right. And I think the, quite, the, the, the thing that's fascinating about your work is that I think it almost slips that conversation and the binary of that conversation. Instead, it asks, well, how then is a motif useful to me so that I can see more of it? Because if we're only writing in response to a white expectation, we're still beholden to that binary. We're still surrendering our own agency to whether we satisfy or dissatisfy this very monolithic gaze. And what I, what I really appreciate about your work is that it goes beyond that question as an unsatisfactory question, that the work goes deeper beyond that. And it, re, it refuses tokenization in the way it is built uh, from line to line and the way the fragmentation avoids cohesion. This is so important to me because often when folks look at marginalized writers, they demand cohesion, they, they want a, a fluid story, and your entire career is built on resisting that. Can you talk a little bit about resistance and the refusal to conform, because that's so important into this book of essays here. One of the things too, I think is, is who are we writing for? Yeah. Yeah. Right, and I, I think the, you know, so I think so much of this has to do with intention. I mean, so much of what I think about are these things that don't occur um, on the page you don't know this stuff, but, um, but I, right. I, so if I'm thinking of, again, if I'm thinking of how am I going to get my poem published in XYZ or how am I going to get a great position or whatever it is that I'm already, I mean, for me, at least personally, I'm already on the wrong track. I mean, what am I writing about? Why am I even writing? Um, and so that's the thing. So if I want to write about, um, I don't know, you know, my dad's black cowboy boots, which he loves, he loves those boots. So they probably show up in poems, but I think they show up as black boots. I don't know. I think that they've shown up a lot. Um, so I don't, again, like if I'm not, um, if I'm writing the work to write the work, 
kind of archival work or to make something separate, a construction and artwork, and I'm not writing to sell or to a certain audience, then whatever, then whatever shows up in the work is going to show up. And, and if it does fit people's stereotype, then so be it. I mean, this is so stupid, but I remember with Glimmering Room, Publishers Weekly did a review of the book and they reduced it. They basically said, you won't like this book unless you're a goth teenage girl. This doesn't have to do with like, I guess it's a class thing, right? Less a race thing, mm -hmm. but, um, but right. So I didn't think about it. I never imagined somebody would do something so reductive as that right in a, in a write-up. But I think the best thing for me, at least, is I just don't think about that stuff. I make the, the artwork and then I send it out. Um, but so it's all about intention, right? I'm not thinking about writing for any kind of audience. I'm not thinking about that. And I think that's, that's a lot of it. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's the why readers are so you know, they carry your work. You know, I've talked to people through the years who memorize your poems. Mm -hmm. I think they, they insist on the inexhaustible nature of an interiority mm -hmm. and that one does not have to write about the recognizable themes of one's identity in order to still be faithful to who they are. And that in fact, the word the even is woven through all those uh, in, in intricacies and all those intersections at once. I want to ask you a little bit of, a little more about this notion of opting out, which you've brought forth so uh, eloquently in this book, and that perhaps in a neo neoliberalist uh, uh, society that privileges uh, competition and wealth above all, that, that measures the success of people under this decree, uh, that perhaps the most radical thing is to refuse, quote unquote, success on those parameters. Um, you say here, Refusing to choose one of either of two binaries, power and articulation, or lack of power and invisibility. I, cho I chose to refuse power. What I am attempting to describe here, to articulate, is in itself inarticulable. This something, this thing that refuses articulation hovers above the words I am using while at the same time remains inscrutably beneath them. This thing I am attempting to get at escapes me. This is because it is nonsensical to refute power. And this nonsensical, quote unquote, uh, notion, I think, is the very thesis that cuts through almost all of your books. Can you talk about this very foundational sentiment here? Of, um, sorry, which one? The, the resistance or the incomprehensibility? Or do you mean? To refute power, to refuse power as a praxis, as a creative praxis, as right. evident here. Yeah, but see, the, I guess under, underneath this, these, these questions, or this question, the other one, is this assumption, and this is the problem with, um, with everything having to do with money and power, is if we're artists, then why are we thinking, and, and I don't mean you, know, you and me, I just mean, mm -hmm. right, all of us, then why are we thinking about selling? I just, it's beyond me or commodifying myself as like, why would I do that to myself, to my, my family, right? I mean, how could I possibly sell my family or, or myself? It's beyond me. And this is normalized, right? This is just sort of the package now. I mean, I know this, but so to me, the question is so, um, let me just think about the word. It's obscene in a way. I mean, not, not your question, but like, I think it's so naturalized and normalized now that I should just commodify myself. I should, you know, I, I won't get specific, but there's certain things I know that um, people want me to do and they would be, um, I would be lying, right? right. You know, that, that my family and, and myself, that we're, we're complicated people. We all are complicated people. And to flatten... Um, you know, I think my family or where I come from to some kind of a stereotype or trope that fits middle class white readers, I, I couldn't, I mean, I just couldn't even do that. So the question to me is just sort of beyond me. The thing I'm always pushing against though is the realization that that's actually the norm, right? Mm -hmm. so I'm pushing against that all the time, but it's never the question of should I or shouldn't I because I don't understand how anybody could say yes to that. Yeah. But um, and I think the other thing, too, is the resistance in the work, right? It's elliptical, and it's pushing up against, and it's contradictory. Um, 
and it has stuff in the world, right? I, I was fully aware when I was reading the archive poems that there are objects, right? There are objects in those poems. I mean, um, so that's also contradictory. Yeah. How can I be talking about these objects if I'm against that class struggle doesn't, or, you know, any of that stuff has nothing to do. I mean, my parents would like to have nice things. Wanting nice things or wanting insurance doesn't mean that you're, that you want to assimilate. You know, and it's not about um, economics. Lots of working class people make a good amount of money. It, it's class, right? It's something different from that. Right. So you didn't ask me that question. I was going off on a tangent, I think. Oh, no, it's, it's all relevant. You're asking these questions that are making me so excited. <laughs> it's so, no, it's all relevant. I think of Bartleby, you know, Melville's Oh, story. yes, of course, yeah. Bring up, um, and I think my, that my, what I was leading at in, in that specific question of refusing power is what does the refusal of power look like aesthetically? I, I know many writers have taken that refusal through the years and the certain uh, sort of um, yeah. result is varies from writer to writer. And I was curious, when we see the result when we read your work, but it will be interesting to hear you say, you know, in what way aesthetically, perhaps even technically uh, down to the line break or the word choices, um, how does your work refuse that power uh, as it, it lives on the page? Right, so, um, yeah, so one thing I was thinking, it's really important for me too to not get trapped in reacting. This is what we're trained to do in a culture like this, right, is to be in this constant state of upset. I mean, especially in the last four years or whatever. So to not react, to actually slow down and, and study a bit and try to figure out what's actually happening. So that's one thing, right? So um, I could write poems that react to the very thing that we're talking about, but then I'm still engaged in the thing that I'm resisting. So I don't want to do that. So it has to be a dialectic, right? It has to be this um, these gaps or spaces in the work that create um, these places where things can get worked out. And so I'm very interested in gaps or um, the, the thing itself existing outside the poem and archive, right? Dropping history or um, things into the poem so that um, the poem cannot be um, reduced. But also there's always this dialectic, there's always this um, working out that has to happen. Um, because again, if I just, you know, this is just me, but for me to just write poems against X, Y, or Z, then I'm still sort of worshiping the thing. And that's not what I want to do, right? I'm actually saying no to the thing, but it's just like what you said. So the, the response is then not to either try to assimilate, but it's also not entirely to say, okay, in a way I'm going to kill myself symbolically, right? Because those are the two options that I'm going to stay here, but I'm going to create this other, this third space, which is, um, I think I wrote about John of Comfort. I'm always thinking about John of Comfort and the dialectic because it creates this third possibility so that it doesn't just have to be these two. Right, right. It, yeah, yeah, I mean, when we think about the Hegelian dialectic, is it insists on that third turn mm -hmm. towards discovery. And uh, I, I think also of alterity, which is a word that comes often um, in, in your own work when you speak of yourself, but when I think of your work as well. And there's a passage in here where you said you talk about while you were in graduate school oh. when we discuss hour of the star by Clarice Lispector mm. the professor asked what we thought I said something akin to what Helen Sisu said about the text that it's a beautiful text about poverty after the professor corrected me telling me it was not about poverty my classmates agreed with him this is the trouble with power those who have it often can't see it and therefore can't perceive what it's not in their line of vision. Their experiences of wielding power and how these experiences have informed and created their ways of understanding the world. And I, I, I think uh, it, it also uh, of Alice Notley in her uh, interviews when she says she wonders what would happen if she could possess a purely woman's voice. And she, she says that the sentence is a male, is, is a male invention. And I think as her career progresses, she starts to get more and more fragmented um, to the point where in my experience in graduate school, a professor even accused her jokingly of being uh, having a stroke. 
right? I can't understand this woman, so she, I must pathologize her. Um, but I think there is, similarly, the seeking of alterity, which also risks comprehension. And, and I think that's what you're getting at here, is that Lispector, at least your reading of Lispector, was not legible um, for that professor. And, and I think often how we, as writers, we negotiate what can be legible and what is not legible, even while we create legibility. That, that sort of is, I think, exactly what you're talking about with the dialectic. And can you talk about that struggle? Because I'm sure that friction there is incredibly intense. Yeah, so the thing I was thinking about with what you just said actually is what I am working on with this book that I'm um, supposed to be working on now um, about class. And part of the problem is that, um, because that was really obviously upsetting, but that kind of stuff, the Lispector thing, it happens all the time. I can't tell you how often it happens. And finally I realized talking to enough people I know who tell me that they never come across working class people ever. And I thought, but what about, you know, the guy at the bodega or the guy at the grocery store or your nanny or your babysitter or your driver or and there's thousands right and and i realized that um right it's a kind of social death it's a symbolic death and that in our culture um, as a result of neoliberalism there are no social classes right but that means an entire right huge population of americans don't exist right so what that means is when when people read lispector for example um, they just see um, like it's a lot of fun and games. People think it's really like beautiful, and it is very beautiful. But it's it's no, it's literally about her own experience growing up in poverty. And if you read interviews or you know you find this out, it's very clear. But the inability to see that is the inability to see an entire group of people. And um, that's what I discovered working on this book is that um, that's. That's what that is. And I know you didn't ask me that question, you asked me a different question, but there's always, I guess, in um, when I write, I don't worry about if people understand it or not, which is a blessing, because if I did, I would never write poems, essays, I do have to worry about that. But with poems, I don't so much. Um, and so I understand that there are parts that fall to the wayside that people don't understand. I don't know, I guess it's just going to be like that. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. I. Um, you know, I, I would be remiss, uh, you know, since we're, we're in an MFA to ask uh, the, the, the origin story, the genesis of a writer's life. Um, you, you mentioned here that you started at community college. Uh, I did the same. And, and community college is a strange space where it's almost like we're, we're, we're trying everything out. We're trying mm -hmm. yeah. this new thing out. It's an it's a unforged ground for, for a lot of us. And it's, it's a lot of first time uh, college students um, within families. And, and it feels to me, my life in community college, arriving at poetry seemed also kind of like an accident. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm curious what it, what it was like for you going from community college to where you are now um, teaching and writing and thinking and, and, and essentially choosing this life, which we know is not easy because the, the capitalistic culture does not support this life, although it pretends to have room for the products it does not have the infrastructure to nurture the makers of these products. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how, how you got here? Yeah, so I, I, um, I met with these really wonderful undergrads before this. Yeah, and I think somebody asked a question that, was, that, made, me, that, that made me talk about this too. And I, um, so the other thing people don't think about um, is that, um, so, with class and race, right? We don't know about things until we see them, right? And so how could I have possibly come across literature or art? Um, my dad didn't finish grammar school. My mom finished high school. I mean, I never did. So I didn't know what a poem was at all, right? High school, community college. I went um, to private college. And then in the final year, the idea of a poem, I took a workshop. And then I was in this terrible workshop, but I thought, wait, this is kind of great. And then I took a year off and I worked and everyone I knew told me don't to get an MFA. I mean, you know, the amount of debt I owe right now is, you know, it's, it's outrageous. Um, but I did anyway. Um, so that's how I came across it. One of the things I realized um, last week when I was talking to my editor about my book is um, so many times, I just feel like so much of my life has been pushing up against gatekeepers and, and 
you know, and, and people saying nice things, but then there's just, it's, it's shut. Um, and being told, right, with neoliberalism, it has to do with meritocracy. So if I just worked harder, you know, and I work really hard, but there's a sense, like, if you worked harder, um, wait, let me see if I can finish where I was going. <laughs> I just forgot where I was going. Hold on. Um, right, but all that stuff, all that pushing up against is what made me who I am now, right? And so um, I wouldn't trade what I have you know, my, um, my writing and my writing life, which is basically all the time, right? I, I don't like teach and then I sit an hour every day and write. I, I see it all as one thing. Um, and it is, it is a kind of, um, it's a dumb thing to do from someone from the background that I'm from. I mean, it's completely stupid. I should have got a job as a lawyer or a doctor, right? That's practical. So in a way it's kind of beautiful that it is this, um, it's like a negation into a negation, right? It's this kind of, if that makes any sense, you know? Well, negative capability is what we're <laughs> talking about here, right? Right, um, right. It's to, to Ashbury, to you, I mean, uh, as evident. Um, I, I, the obvious question, I think, behind all this is um, why the leap to, to essays? I think what you're participating in um, which is a, a lot of this lineage of, of women of color or women on the margins moving from poetry, uh, you know, well into their career from prose, as if the moment where poetry, particularly the lyric poem, no longer suffice the questions they explored. I'm thinking of Maggie Nelson, Claudia Rankin, Banu Kabheel, Teresa Hakyung Cha, um, and here you are after six books of poems, you turn to essays and in, in a way that are so polished, um, so fierce and so thorough. Um, and and it, 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 you can tell that it's something you've been thinking about for a long time. Why now? What made you turn to prose? Right, so exactly. I was also thinking of Gloria Anzaldúa and Sherry Moraga, right? And I think that um, the thing, right, exactly. So I went and I got an MFA in art writing. And if I hadn't done that, I couldn't write the essays. And then it also took two years of graduate school. I really, um, poetry is amazing. And I see it as a, almost like in the realm of visual art, the way that I make poetry, it, it's just this other thing. But it's very evasive, right? It's elliptical. And um, if I try to write about the things that I'm trying to write about with poetry, you know, it's just, I will never get there. And so the things that I'm trying to figure out are actually impossible. I mean, this thing with class, like why, why is it like this? And I, I've, I've spent a lot of time not thinking it out and I've, I've come to a place. So it took a lot of thinking, a lot of research. Um, and then I have to be very concise. Like I forgot the word you used, but very concise. I have to be very clear and concise and back everything up and help the reader. I really have to help the reader to see the problem with both of these books and especially the one that's coming out next year is I'm trying to help the reader see something they can't see. Yeah, right. It's impossible, right? And there's no way, no amount of writing poetry, I'm sorry, don't hate me, don't send me hate mail, but <laughs> I just don't think, not the kind of poetry I write, right? The kind of poetry I write can't get to that. What I need, you know, I really, really, um, have to be like a scientist you know i have to be very very um precise and i have to think of both sides you know i have to think why is it like this you know and and what i found is that people um don't believe their social classes in this country everybody's not being mean they just don't know right but that means like i said an entire um you know i would say the majority of americans then fall invisible right 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 and I, I think that's exactly why you were suited, um, I think, quite naturally to begin these essays, using an elliptical form to almost opt out of the exotification or the potential to be exotified as a body. And to now, on your own terms, having written a great body of work in the poems, to reach towards lucidity, which is exactly what we need when talking about class in this country, because the... The, the great wealth gap is so normalized, so obscured, that we, we, we like to see ourselves as creators of culture, large culture, uh, you know, in, in the, the bi-coastal cities. And so many of people, particularly people of color, live within the class struggles that you're articulating here. And, and so I, it was lovely to hear you talk about what seems like inevitable 
um, and, and I'm really excited to see you continue uh, on this. And do you think now, okay, so now I, I'm thinking, um, my nerd brain is thinking like, you know, you got the, the lyrical mode, you have these incredible essays, will they combine? Will you end up writing a hybrid text, um, perhaps even with photos? Do you see the, po the lyric poem living in, a, in a, play, a page like this? Do we see that play from you uh, further down the line? No, sorry. <laughs> so I really think that they're separate. I think that the, like the poetry to me too, like again, it's like painting. It is this thing that I do. I go somewhere else and I, I go to poetry for things I don't have answers for. And, and like I do a collection and I don't get to the end. I just make a little move forward. Mm. Um, and so, but essays... I mean, the thing that I'm doing is I'm, I, and I have been for a while is studying philosophy and trying to, because I feel like there's answers there. Um, and so I feel like more, um, I think that they'll stay separate. I, and I think that form is really important because if, for example, if I were to use, I wanna be careful. Um, I just think that I have to be very precise like I said, and, and really guide the reader when I'm talking about these things that are volatile um, and can be very um, painful for people and also unclear, right? People don't know the things I'm trying to talk about are very um, ephemeral. So I have, to, I have to be very deliberate and to use an image I think would um, distract from that. And, and uh, yeah, so I think that they're separate things. Beautiful. Uh, I like to close with this last question. Uh, it's a personal question for me. You know, I, I grew up with a mother who was biracial, who quote unquote passes, right? Until she opens her mouth. And the lack of that social capital of English uh, collapses that possibility um, of passing thoroughly, right? Which is so vital and uh, to certain privileges in this country. And so she was in this liminal space all her life of being visibly past, but then socially and culturally on the outside. Um, and you talk quite brilliantly. I've, I've, I've yet to, to see someone go this uh, concise and this complicated, embracing the complications of passing uh, in your work here. And, and I like to just read a little bit what you say here. My light hair and eyes come from my father's Mexican side of the family. Though he appears Mexican-American, he has darker skin than I, black hair and indigenous facial features. When he was born, my father too had blonde hair and light eyes. His mother was of Spanish origin and had light skin, hair and eyes. When assessed with more than a superficial quick take, I am unmistakably of Mexican descent. And you talk about how the idea of passing is something of violence that is mapped onto the body without the subjects uh, agency in that because it maps towards cliche and tropes. I guess the perennial question for all of us, regardless of where we're writing from, is how do we turn to poems to break out of that cage of the gaze uh, th that, that we have no say in? Where's the way out? Where's the way forward, uh, particularly in your work? So one of the things I was thinking about is the, I'm going to just talk about class some more, is that, you know, so part of class and capital is, um, is cultural, right? So everything I know about art and culture, I've learned, which might seem normal, but many people I know grew up among it. That's a whole different thing, right? So they have ease. That's one thing Bordeaux talks about that. And the other thing is connections right networking so my family they don't have connections I didn't learn how to make connections I don't I just send work out so um, those are huge that's capital right so you can even pass right one one I don't mean you one can pass as whatever um, but without that kind of capital even if you have money you can't get anywhere right you're not going to get a job I mean a certain kind of job right you're not going to get um, certain things aren't going to happen you're not going to get your show, your art shown in a gallery, for example, right? So that kind of stuff nobody talks about, and that's really that's really the thing um, I think that matters so much. And then the so in terms of your question, though, um, I think that um, these are such great questions that actually the more and this is so silly, but I feel like the more honest I am. So 
in the early work where um, I do, you know, a talk, I talk about, um, you know, food stamps or, um, which, you know, even a few years ago, I, I was getting food stamps or pantries or these kinds of things. That's true and it complicates things. So people want to, you know, put the writer in this block, all of a sudden you have to think, wait, but what about that? Or writing about, you know, war or other things like that that are part of um, who I am, my embodied self. If I write completely out of who I am and then revise toward form, then the work is already going to evade certain stereotypes. The only way it's going to fit into a stereotype is if I go out of my way to construct these tropes. Right. And I guess that's what I'm getting at is that if I'm honest and I write about my family, there's so much, you know, it's just, there's no way you could put it into a cookie cutter thing. The only way, again, it could be is if I did that on purpose, which I, I do think is a form of violence. Right. Beautifully said. Oh my <laughs> goodness. We could talk all day. We could, yeah. yes. <laughs> like, I, I, I think, you know, as someone who also comes from a working class background with family, you're absolutely right. I, I was, I remember being so jealous when I would hear young writers, my peers, when I just started writing, they would say, oh, my mother got me, brought, uh, you know, got me to writing camp when I was in high school. They, uh, they encouraged me to submit to the New Yorker when, when I was a sophomore, you know, they bought me these magazines. And I remember relishing that opportunity so much. But on the flip side, I think and I wonder if this is true for you, because I think when I look at your work, I think of the utmost agency and freedom of choice and freedom of choosing one's own tradition and one's aesthetic. And, and I think for me, it was because I didn't have that pressure from parents who had social capital, I was free to kind of follow my curiosity, mm -hmm. to really ask myself, Ocean, what do you want to discover? And you said that for us, what we have, we have to learn. And, and I think on one hand, that is a, a deficit. On another hand, it is great wealth of freedom. Do, do you feel like that was for you as well? No, it's true. And I think that, um, so one of the things with Liz Spector's Hour of the Star is Maccabia, her main character is really curious, right? And, and she's like a loser, right? That's what the narrator calls her. The world thinks she's a loser, but she has this curiosity. And I think you're right, right? So everything, um, I've gone after have been things like, they were impossible for me. You know, even me now studying philosophy or working on essays of philosophy, that's impossible. You know, my dad didn't finish grammar school. Like this is not a possibility. This isn't something he showed me, you know, when I was a child, it's beyond my reach. And so, right, I'm curious. There are all these things I don't know anything about. I mean, now I do, right? But you know what I mean? So I have, I, I'm um, super curious which isn't to say, you know, everybody isn't curious, but I think that's part of it is really growing up in this little world and then all of a sudden things open and just like I'd never seen that before, you know, when I saw the first Francis Bacon or whatever, I thought, this is amazing. So I think you're right, right? And then that shapes me, right? And I get more and more curious. And there, but there's also the thing about everything. And I know other people from, you know, backgrounds like ours have this, like everything you do, then you know that you've done it. I remember um, coming across people who never submit poems because they, they know other people who publish. Well, anyway, and I remember, but then how would you know that your work is good, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. So it, there's like this really wonderful thing where it's like everything's handcrafted, right? So I have curiosity and everything um, that I, you know, I go after, I go after it. And if I get it, I get to feel so good about it, you know, because I've, done that thing. Well, we, we feel good about having you and having the great wealth of work. Thank you for gracing us with your incredibly expansive mind and your courageous work. Uh, I know my students uh, were really excited for this and I'm, I hope uh, the community uh, has really uh, bathed in, in what you have to say for us and we look forward to everything else you have coming your way. Thank you, Cynthia, and uh, thank you so much. It's a thank pleasure. you so much, Ocean. It was lovely talking to you. Beautiful. Bye. Bye. Thank you to you both um, for that enlightening discussion. I feel like you've given us all so much to think about. Um, so yeah, thanks again to Cynthia Cruz, our visiting faculty at UMass Amherst MFA. Thank you to Ocean Bung, one of our poetry faculty of the MFA. 
Um, remember that Amherst Books carries Cynthia's collection, so we'll drop another link down in the chat so you can check that out. A uh, special thanks uh, to Marcella Haddad for providing technical assistance. Uh, we hope you'll join us on September 24th at 6 p.m. for a reading with Gabriel Bump, author of Everywhere You Don't Belong and a 2017 graduate of the MFA. You can register for that on the MFA website and we'll also drop that link down in the chat. So we'll leave the, the window open again for another 20 minutes, um, but thanks again for coming out. We hope to see you at our future readings and have a good night. Mm -hmm.